Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest Brentwood Chamber of Commerce, Brentwood Business Partnership and Brentwood Borough Council Backing Brentwood Business webinar. My name is Colin Barber and I'm Chairman of Brentwood Chamber of Commerce, and it's my pleasure to host today's web webinar, um, which is with uh, Paul Durant from PDT Sales Consultancy. Um, I'd like to thank him very much for being with us today and agreeing to uh, present to you um, on the subject of um, why business resilience, which I'll tell you more about in a very short space of time. <clears throat> uh, as I say, my name is Colin Barber, I'm Chairman of Brentwood Chamber of Commerce, and these webinars are put on on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, Brentwood Business Partnership, and Brentwood Borough Council. Uh, we used to run joint training sessions at Brentwood Town Hall. Obviously, whilst we've had to cut back on those, we've now switched over to uh, running these uh, virtual webinars at the moment, twice a week on a Tuesday and a Friday. Um, if you haven't seen the previous webinars and you'd like to catch up with them, they are all available on the Brentwood Chamber of Commerce YouTube channel, so I'd recommend you take a look at them. Um, moving forward, uh, if you'd uh, like to uh, find out more about what webinars are happening, then it, keep in touch with um, either of the three organisations on our websites or social media. We'll be publishing the forthcoming webinars. Indeed, if you're uh, interested in a particular subject, obviously the focus of the webinars is helping us through the coronavirus crisis. If you're interested in a particular subject, then do let us know and we can uh, try and find a presenter to talk about that particular subject. Uh, or alternatively, um, if you're an expert in a certain field and you think the, uh, the audience would be interested to hear what you've got to say about helping them through this crisis, uh, then do contact me at uh, webinar uh, at brentwoodchamber.co.uk and I'll be happy to hear from you and discuss uh, what you think you could perhaps offer on a webinar. Uh, just to mention to you, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, familiar with Zoom webinar by now, but just a couple of buttons uh, which will be uh, of use to you during the webinar. Um, the only people actually talking during the webinar would be myself and Paul. Uh, the rest of you are, are just um, on watch only, uh, but you can communicate with us uh, in two ways. First of all, uh, on your little uh, panel, which is normally at the bottom of the screen, uh, there's a chat option. If you want to send us a message at any time, just click chat and type in the message. Um, also, perhaps more importantly, there's a Q&A button. So if you've got any questions for Paul at any time during the webinar, uh, just type them in and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions at the end. Uh, if you've got anything already uh, that you want to ask, then feel free to uh, type that in whilst it's fresh in your mind. And we'll come on to the uh, questions uh, towards the end. Uh, as I mentioned, the webinars are available on YouTube. So just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded, um, which also means if you haven't had a chance to if you have to leave early and don't get a chance to listen to it all, or um, if you want to recap or go over some of the points, then uh, that will be an opportunity. And we'll be sharing the link, uh, the YouTube link with you, um, probably later on today, but if not, certainly by uh, tomorrow morning. So as I say, our presenter today is uh, Paul Durant. And uh, are you there, Paul, just to uh, check you're there and move us? Uh, yes, good morning, everybody. Yeah, I'm here, I'm healthy and I'm well. Good, good to see you, Paul, and thanks for joining. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, uh, my, I guess my first question is, I know you're a sales consultant, a sales coach and a sales trainer, um, but today's business webinar is on business resilience. So uh, why business resilience? What, is, is that another area which you cover or what, what's the reason for that today? Uh, yeah, it's OK. It's, it's not my day job, but, um, but um, I've got a reasonable knowledge in this area. Uh, in a previous life, I was a tender bid writer, so I, I did have to... Uh, write a lot of detail about business continuity planning for the, the, the companies that I worked for to be able to effectively answer the tender bids uh, to the point where I was actually included in the BCP, the business continuity planning meetings. Um, so that's a part of it. But also uh, I did a lot of research into business resilience and the mindset of being more resilient uh, last year for my, my current book is out at the moment called Entrepreneurial Sales. So that's, that's where my, my knowledge comes from. It's not the day job, but I've got a reasonable level of knowledge uh, of that, and obviously working with different types of businesses in my in my role as a sales coach as well, I do obviously pull on their experiences of of how they make their business more resilient. Yeah. Okay. Well, I couldn't really think of a better title for a webinar at this time: business resilience, because that's what it all boils down to. Um, obviously, we all want the uh, all our businesses in Brentwood. We want them all to come out the other side, um, if certainly surviving, but if maybe more healthy and. Um, perhaps in the case of some businesses, some new ideas in terms of how they operate. So uh, I'm certainly looking forward to your presentation today, Paul. So over to you. Right. OK, so I'm just going to share my screen.
Right. Okay. So, um, as I said, good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to uh, to log in to today's uh, presentation. So, as Colin said, this will be available, uh, um, obviously, on the YouTube channel if you do need to uh, view it. But also, I can make a PDF version of the slides available if anybody wants that as well. So, um, I think probably, hopefully, most of you know me. I, I've, I've been uh, in and around Brentwood for uh, 30 years, virtually. Um, uh, and I've uh, interacted with quite a few businesses uh, locally as well. But for those that don't know me, uh, I'm a sales consultant, coach and trainer. So that's myself. I have three branches to my business. The sales clinic, which is the consultancy part. The academy, which is the training and development. So I do online training as well as face-to-face -face training, classroom training. I, I work with a lot of organizations in London and do group training, but obviously they've stopped um, currently. But I, I'm doing still a, a fair bit of webinar q a expert sessions and i'm still doing some one-to-one uh, -one stuff on skype with some of my retained clients and the sales support that's the third part of the branch to my business and that's uh, all the back office stuff so i can help clients if they're looking to recruit a sales candidate for the first time i can help with that process i can help uh, manage uh, sell, sales people remotely for a number of uh, guaranteed hours per month i can help with tender bids a proposal writing, scripts, et cetera, anything that's back office to do with sales, that, that's basically involved in that part. So, so in summary, really, I, I help fix your sales related problems. I upskill yourself or your salespeople as far as sales is concerned, and I can optimize your sales. So as regards my accreditations, uh, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Sales Management. I'm a, a member of the IOD, a longstanding member um, over 10 years now with the Institute of Directors. Uh, also a member of the North London Chambers of Commerce and Enterprise, one of their trainers, uh, obviously a member locally here with the Brentwood Chamber. I'm also an advisor member for French Prize Nation. Some of you might know Jill Poet, who runs Orb, Organisation for Responsible Business in Southend. And for those that don't, that's a, a small group of about 200 uh, sustainable low carbon businesses that meet up once every other month and we try and raise some money for some local charities. So that's uh, my accreditations and there's some of the gigs that I've done. So starting left to right very quickly, um, that's the uh, business show, uh, LBC's business hour. That's the startup show in the middle that I've spoken at. Some of you might recognize that staircase. That's actually at City Hall. That's where the finale of The Apprentice uh, is held. That's where they do their, their final episode there. It's quite an interesting venue to speak at. And then also I was on a small delegation of uh, some business advisors uh, talking to uh, number 10 last year uh, about uh, post-Brexit support for small businesses. But who knows what's going to happen with that? that? That'll be an interesting addition at the end of the year, won't it, to the, uh, the economy. Right, so what to expect from today? Uh, we're going to um, briefly talk about uh, what business resilience is. Um, hopefully, um, I'll share with you uh, how to plan for most uh, common disaster scenarios. And then we can look at uh, identifying where any future property uh, opportunities are uh, for growing a business once you're through that recovery stage of uh, obviously dealing with a disaster. So what is business resilience? Well, look, in simple terms, it's basically to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. But there are two elements to that business resilience. There's making your business more resilient, but also it's making yourself more resilient. It's having the right mindset to deal with a disaster scenario to the point where you can recover through that and get the business up and functioning. So some of you might be familiar with the term disaster recovery. Well, that's basically a plan to recover your business or the critical elements of your business after a specific disaster event. But it's a little bit different to business continuity planning. Your business continuity planning or plan is a process of creating a whole system of recovery from potential threats, but it's identifying those potential threats first and looking to mitigate some of those if possible. So it's a much more comprehensive plan. So the difference between the two is that uh, your disaster recovery is a reactive plan to one particular event, whereas your business continuity plan is a proactive plan that's considering all types of events and it's covering all aspects of the business. So your disaster recovery is actually part of your business continuity plan. And a, a lot of small businesses, they have the disaster recovery plan, but they, that's only part of the picture. They don't have the full business continuity plan. So that's what you should be looking uh, or aiming to do is to put in place a, a much more comprehensive plan that looks to mitigate some of those risks first, but also it looks at how you, you can uh, get the whole business up and functioning, not, not just the critical functions after an event. So uh, obviously we're in a, a disaster event at the moment, but technically this is actually a phenomena because it's man-made. So are these common? Well, to be honest with you, they're not. Um, there's some uh, stats there for the leading causes of business continuity planning disasters from the Strategic Research Corporation. 
as you can see that nearly half of the, the most common uh, disasters are hardware failures. So they are servers falling over. Next, you've got human error at 32%. Then you've got so software and firmware errors. Then at 7%, you've got computer viruses and security breaches, which I suspect that will increase uh, over the, the, the next year or two. And then just a small 3% makes up natural disasters. So what we are currently experiencing, it's not common. Um, recessions tend to happen once a decade, but global um, pandemics like this tend to happen only once a century. But s some of the uh, uh, conservationists, et cetera, and the environmentalists are telling us that these sorts of types of extreme events they may become more common purely because of the, the growing population. So within that 3%, uh, the three most common natural disasters are actually half of those are floods. Um, then you've got storms at 28%, uh, then you've got earthquakes at 8%. And then after that, you've got the likes of bushfires, landslides, uh, volcanoes, tsunamis, those sorts of types of, even meteorite strikes, they're very, very rare, but I think Russia experienced a couple of those uh, uh, a year or two ago. So those are the sort of uh, most common natural disasters, floods, storms, and earthquakes. Now, as far as uh, our position is concerned, we are actually, um, we're on the edge of the, uh, obviously, uh, European continent there. So we're very susceptible to those North Atlantic storms. They come across on the conveyor belt because of the jet stream. So, so we are prone to certain types of events more than others. So typically, it's, for us, it's the storms. You know, we've got the stormy seasons, typically in spring and the autumn. Uh, October is known normally as the windy month. That's when we tend to get a lot of wind damage and storm damage. But we don't tend to get the, the most extreme temperature uh, rises and falls as they do on the European continent. But um, these natural disasters, they don't actually feature too highly in the most common insurance claims. In fact, the most common insurance claim is burglary and theft. They make up 20% of all insurance claims. That's followed closely by water, snow and ice at 15%. So that's burst pipes, that sort of type of thing. Then you've got wind and hail. So that's the storm damage that you, you typically get. That's 15%. Then fire and smoke at 10%. And having been in fire protection myself, uh, I can tell you that normally it's the smoke that causes more damage than the fire itself. Uh, and then you've got slips and falls uh, at 10%. And then after that, you've got things like criminal damage, vandalism, uh, libel, uh, slander, defamation, that sort of type of thing. So those are the most common insurance claims. And, and that's the scary stat there is that unfortunately, uh, a quarter of small businesses, they don't reopen after a, a major event or an incident. And one of the reasons for that is purely a, a lack of a business continuity planning. They, they've got no real strategy for being able to recover the business after uh, an event has happened. So um, who needs help? Well, we all need help. Um, and this is just a stat that came out a few years ago. The government commissioned a report to, to try and find out why small businesses weren't growing and why the failure rate is relatively high at 50% uh, after year five. And the conclusion for that um, report was that small businesses, they don't ask for the help when they need it. So, you know, they'll need help when they're growing, but they'll also need help after an event, uh, uh, you know, disaster recovery type of event. And there are a number of reasons for that. There's fear, uh, denial, you know, denying that uh, something's going to happen, uh, that, that, you know, you're not going to be impacted by something. Mistrust, mistrust of the government. The, the government are coming to a bit of criticism at the moment because they they made uh, 300 billion available in state aid to small businesses, but they've only paid out 2.8 billion. And they've only helped 16,000 businesses so far financially. Uh, and there's what, over 5.9 million SMEs here in the UK. So maybe a bit of mistrust, but pride as well can get in the way. Uh, I've seen this so many times with um, business owners, uh, and I have to say men like me that are in their 50s. They've grown their business, it's their baby. They don't want to uh, ask for any help, and sometimes they let pride get in their way to, uh, when they need that help. But there's help out there. And as Colin said, um, you've got a directory of uh, webinars, which potentially could help you if you've missed those. They're on the YouTube channel there, and there's some um, additional information there on the, the Chamber website. You've also got lots of help with the council there. They've got a business page there, which you can go and visit. And there's, there's um, news about how, how you can be helped at a local level. And then you've obviously got the gov.uk website there as well. So all of the financial support and help for businesses there in one area. So that's the business interruption scheme, details about um, uh, rate re reliefs, et cetera, and holidays for um, uh, VAT and tax, et cetera. Um, so there are, you know, sources of information out there to help you. So if you're struggling, you know, just, just ask for the help or go to the resources where that can give you the help. 
So if you're in that category that you've got a little bit of mistrust about the, uh, the government, um, obviously they've just announced now that they're, they're going to be launching bounce back schemes on Monday. Now these are 100% state backed, which means that the, the, uh, the banks, they're not going to be so reticent in um, granting these. So they, they're available uh, as of Monday. Um, you can uh, borrow up to 25% of your turnover up to a value of £50,000. So that would mean if you're trading over £200,000 per annum, you can borrow up to £50,000 through one of these bounce back loans. But again, nobody knows how quickly this money is going to come out or, um, or how difficult it's going to be to apply for those. So there are other uh, forms that you can get your uh, capital if you need that working capital quickly. So obviously, this is probably what we've all been doing, bootstrapping at the moment, you know, savings, credit cards, etc. Um, crowdfunding campaigns, uh, applying for a traditional loan if you've been uh, turned down for one of the state-backed loans. Uh, angel investors, they're still out there. They're looking, like anybody else, they're looking for those opportunities in a depressed market. So there is a potential to get uh, investment from angel investors. And then obviously there, there are connection services on the web there. So you just need to Google those and, and shortlist some several local options there for you. So again, if you need that financial help, you've got the state. That would be uh, my suggestion for your first port of call. But then there are other uh, outlets um, that you can go to if you need that working capital. So obviously, um, that's uh, working capital to get you through uh, uh, a particular scenario like uh, what we're experiencing now. But you do need to make some uh, contingencies. And unfortunately, we, we have this cognitive bias towards um, not preparing for things that we think aren't going to happen. And pandemics aren't common. So, um, you know, uh, people don't necessarily uh, prepare for them. And uh, that, that's the stats as far as uh, preparation is concerned. Um, who has a business continuity plan? Well, it's, it's three quarters of large businesses. And I'm surprised, actually. I, I thought uh, more uh, large businesses would have a, con a business continuity plan because obviously you know, they, there's a lot more riding on the, the people that are employing, the supply chains, etc. But um, these are the stats. Uh, Medium-sized businesses, uh, two-thirds have got a business continuity plan, but only a quarter of small businesses have a business continuity plan. And a, a disaster or a, a business interruption can happen to any type or size of business. And insurance alone, you might be saying, well, I, you know, I don't need a business continuity plan. I've got insurance. Well, it's not a strategy. It's not a business continuity strategy. Many policies, they, you know, they, they don't uh, include the peripheral damage, uh, things like loss of customers, market share setbacks in launching a new product or a service or, or, or R&D research and development. And you've probably seen some high, um, okay, you know, high profile cases in the news at the moment uh, where some organizations, some insurers have been taken to court because not paying out on their uh, business interruption uh, insurance and the Hiscox I know is one of those because it does state that potentially they would uh, pay out on uh, an event such as happening now but it's the wording there that they're disputing so that's that's going to court at the moment so uh, you know it's it's not uh, insurance alone is not a business continuity strategy so um, if you want to formulate the uh, your, your strategy your business continuity strategy there, there is a simple process you can follow which is IMP. IMP stands for identify potential risks the M is mitigating or avoiding those risks in the first place. And then the P is planning appropriate contingencies. So that's the basic process. Now, if you want to um, stretch that out to a more detailed process to formulate a plan, this is the process that you can follow. Now, as I've said, I'm happy to make these slides available as a PDF at the end of the day, or if you, if you want to take a, a shot of that with your cameras, whatever. So I'll leave that up for a few seconds. That's a more detailed process that you can follow. So identify the scope of your plan, the objectives, the budget you're working with. Uh, formulate a team, a business continuity team. If you're a sole trader like me, you are your team. But you can obviously get help and advice from mentors, from business associates to, to help you put together your plan. You need to do your, your business impact analysis. So uh, understand what impact a particular event will have on each of your business functions. Uh, you need to look at your strategies, uh, addressing those effects, putting in place those arrangements, and then what those measures would look like. Write up and draft your plan. Um, undergo a test, evaluate and modify that test. Uh, that's number seven there. And then go back to point five to, to finalize your plan, your draft, once you've tested it and you've modified it and you've evaluated it. So that's a more detailed process that you can follow to, to put together your business continuity plan. Right, so um, obviously now you've got to look at which uh, functions are going to be affected within your business. Well, obviously it's your key functions there. So it's your IT, your facilities management, your operations basically, 
Um, your staff has absenteeism, particularly in a pandemic or a, a, you know, a virus type situation like here. Your health and safety arrangements are key as well. So you've got to look at a number of key functions for your restoration. But there are, there are real priority um, functions that you need to consider, um, obviously, when you're looking to uh, put together your business continuity plan and recover your business. And the first one is an alternate site. Now, uh, if you're using premises, commercial premises, obviously, uh, you, you need to think about, uh, you know, if they're affected by fl fire, flood, damage, etc. Um, you need to think about a similar type of um, uh, site or location that can serve your basic function. Now, if you're, even if you're a home-based business like me, my alternate site is I've identified the um, a, a serviced uh, office do over in Worley. I'm in Brentwood, um, hopefully like most of you are. But as you'll know, there's a, a serviced office in Worley there. So that's my, my continuity plan for if there was a fire or a flood here at my home and I couldn't carry on working from home here. That, that's my alternate site there. So if you're employing staff, think about... Um, identifying a temp agency that might be able to provide you with certain staff. For argument's sake, if you've got a logistics fleet there, you might want to uh, look at a temp agency that provides drivers. So think about, um, you know, your staff. If there was a pandemic, you know, uh, locally and all of your staff were knocked out, you know, how would you uh, continue with your business? So employing people, think about uh, alternative employment for uh, your staff there. Suppliers, um, think about your supply chain as well. Um, I worked for a stationary company uh, a fair few years back. And we used a dedicated logistics company to, to make our deliveries. And unfortunately, you know, they, their business uh, ceased trading one day. And um, there wasn't necessarily the, 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 uh, the level of planning perhaps there should have been. And we ended up using a number of different multi-drop logistics companies. And it was chaos. Uh, parcels were going to different people. They were going to the wrong people. And the company, unfortunately, lost nearly a third of their customers over that period. So it's really important to think about what happened if one of your suppliers could no longer work have a, a, a B list of suppliers that potentially could obviously um, take up the gauntlet for you. Your IT is critical as we've learned, you know, uh, we've carried on working from home here. That's because we've got internet connections here at home. But what if your uh, ISP or your web host or your web developer, if they ceased trading, have you got somebody alternate to be able to carry on with your IT function? So again, think about um, some uh, a, a, a B list of uh, suppliers. And then finally, alternate transport, you know, Again, um, you might have light commercial vehicles. Uh, again, many year ago, I worked for a, a Northgate vehicle hire where you can hire a light commercial vehicle or even a car by the day, by the week or by the month. And if you had to have that vehicle for longer than a month or two, they, they would even allow you to wrap it in the, the corporate colours and the, the company logo. So think about, um, you know, transport. If you're reliant on transport for your business, um, just, just try and identify some uh, sources locally that could give you that transport if for our, so, you know, for whatever reason your vehicles uh, were no longer working. So again just draw up a vetted list of alternative sources and you can include that in your business continuity plan. So those are your key uh, functions really which you should be looking to address. So uh, you may still be thinking oh it's a lot of hassle isn't it um, putting together that business continuity plan but there are some additional benefits here so I'm just going to run through these quickly. So first of all, it's going to help your business cope better in a crisis. It's, it's going to minimize the disruption, not only to you, but to your customers as well. And that's important. You need to keep up your service levels in a situation like this because your customers may be, well be reliant on you and, and your products and services. You can reduce the risk or amount of lost revenue um, as well. Also, it reduces your operational downtime, which is obviously going to help you with your, your turnover and your revenue and getting the business up and running fun and functioning far quicker and it results in decreased insurance premiums as well so there's an additional ben uh, financial benefit there and then finally it's going to help you protect your company reputation as well so if you can keep trading and going and and supporting those customers that rely on you that's going to be beneficial for you and your reputation in the long term so as i said just remember to review your business continuity plan at least once a year uh, and test those measures to make sure it's fit for purpose so that's the, um, the, the business continuity planning part of it. So you're into the recovery phase now, which is where we are. They're obviously, the, the government have announced next week they're going to be announcing some measures on relaxing the lockdown. So that's, there's a bit of light there now at the end of the tunnel. Looks like that we're going to be phasing in, going back to work, but we'll be employing social distancing measures, that sort of type of thing. But once we're back in, in the seat, as it were, you now we're going to be looking to generate sales and looking for those um, early traction opportunities to, to bring some revenue in. 
So uh, where will those opportunities be? Well, obviously we're all gonna have less budget because um, these companies that are your customers, they wouldn't have been generating revenue either. So they're gonna have less budget to spend. So they're gonna be looking at only essential purchases. So in, in simple, simple terms, there's essential and non-essential purchases. What you've got to do as a seller now is to convince and, um, and prove that your product or service is an essential product or service for your customer, and it's going to aid them in their own recovery. So if you can do that, that's, that's going to mean in their mind's eye that your product or service is promoted much higher into their list of priority purchases, which means you're more, more likely to make that, they're, they're more likely to make that purchase and you're more likely to make that sale. So what should you, you, should, what should you do? You should, well, first of all, reach out to your existing customer base. You know, the, the, they're your uh, existing customers. I think it takes uh, somewhere between five and seven times the cost to find a new customer than it is to keep and sell to an existing customer. So they're the ones that you should be reaching out to. Remind them you're there, send them a, li a little note just to remind them of how you can help them, the products and services that you provide them. Uh, and maybe the, this, we'll go into this in a second about some offers that you're offering them. So show them some TLC, some tender loving care. You might want to revisit and repurpose your offering. So look at your products and services and think about, are they still relevant for the, what's the situation that's currently available now? And just to give you a couple of examples, there, there's a couple of micro uh, breweries and distilleries that have converted their alcohol stock into hand gel. And then there's other uh, organizations that have repurposed their manufacturing engineering to produce ventilators. So they've repurposed their, their product and service range. So um, the classic one is we're all stuck at home here. We want to be, uh, we want to be educated. We want to be uh, entertained. It, have you thought about putting your products and services online? You know, I've, I've got an online training academy of 14 different uh, online um, courses now. And that's obviously uh, kept my, you know, my business ticking over on a passive income level. But again, you know, potentially can you teach people to do what you do? And can you do that online? Uh, offer bundled packages and discounts and incentives. You know, uh, again, we're so used to this, aren't we? We buy something on Amazon and uh, straight away we're, you know, people who bought this also bought that. As long as a natural fit and a symmetry for uh, an additional product or service, why not incentivize your customers to buy more than one product or service as long as they go together and they work together? So discounts, incentives and bundled packages is something you can do. Uh, flexible pricing, you know, um, again, if, you, if your particular brand or product, your product or service is one particular cost and it's outside of the budget of your customer currently, is there any way that you could strip that product or service back, uh, maybe offer a, 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 um, a budget range of that perhaps, a, a lesser price, which will make it more affordable to your customer who's got less budget at the moment. Um, when I worked for Yellow Pages many years ago, we used to have a gold, silver, bronze approach where we'd go to our customers with three different packages for their advertising. So at least they had some scope. You know, that if you go to a customer with one price and it's not within their budget, there's nowhere to go with that. At least if you offer them uh, some alternative pricing there, it might mean that you can make the sale. Your margin or, or profit may not be as great, but at least you're making a sale, you're generating some revenue and some turnover. Uh, and then finally, offer some extended payment terms for your struggling clients if they need it. And obviously, if you can afford to do that yourself. Um, you know, my, I'm still working with a couple of retained clients coaching via Skype. Uh, my standard uh, terms are 30 days. I'm offering them 60 days ter terms at the moment. And if they need anything more than that, I'm happy to talk to them about that as well. So if you can afford to do that, think about offering some extended payment terms for your customers. And then, as I said, finally, revisit your value proposition. You might need to adapt your messaging. So that's what you're saying about your products and services on your website, on your posts, on, on your marketing material. You just might need to think about a changing the messaging around that to how you can help your customers recover quicker with their own particular predicament. So uh, that's finding new opportunities. So where are those opportunities going to be? Well, like any recession, there are faster recovering sectors than others. And uh, obviously, traditionally, uh, probably you all know this, that construction, manufacturing, finance, leisure, especially travel and leisure at the moment uh, and hospitality really suffered with this particular situation. So those are the ones where uh, people are going to have less, less money to spend. But uh, the ones that really are um, going to be in a better position to, to buy from uh, the likes of you and I are going to be the ones that are in the IT and telecom sector, uh, freight and logistics, healthcare, um, discount retailers to a certain extent, and home help. Now, when I say home help, I don't necessarily mean somebody that's going to come and do your cooking and shopping for you. It's anybody that provides services or products to you in your home as we're home working at the moment. 
So again, that's education providers, it's uh, people that are providing entertainment, it's products that we need for our homes or home offices. I mean, I, I ordered a new, uh, we, I had a branch fall off a tree and hole my shed uh, about a month ago. I thought that's oh, going to be easy to buy a shed online now, isn't it? I've got to wait six weeks for a shed. They're all sold out, all the basic elements. But I'm guessing what people have been doing is buying sheds to try and convert into home offices. So, you know, there are always um, particular companies or sectors that are fair, will fare better than others in um, this sort of type of scenario, this disaster situation. And they're the ones that will have more budget to spend with the likes of you and I. So what you need to do is revisit your prospect or customer base, cross-reference those customers against the faster recovering sectors. And those really are the customers that, or the prospects that you should be speaking to first because they're going to have more disposable income. So this is really just a summary now. Um, first of all, I think we're all in this space. You know, we've accepted that this situation has impacted our business, it's impacted our customers, and we've got to be pragmatic about that. So really what we need to do is not get distracted from our core aim, which is continuing to recover the business and get it up and functioning again. It's also being clear and decisive in our actions. So you know, have a plan, formulate that plan, implement that plan, but more importantly, hold your nerve. Uh, don't assume that all challenges are insurmountable. So, you know, if you've got a challenge which you think you'll never get past, you can chunk it down to smaller parts or draw on your, your, your network of business associates. And you may have a mentor that you can speak to. There's always somebody that can help you with a problem. And most problems, you, you, you can get past them if you tackle them in the right way. Uh, borrow best emerging practice. So, you know, people are looking to China at the moment. They're, they're uh, a bit ahead of us in their recovery phase there. And what we've seen there is that their recovery has been more U-shaped than V-shaped. And that even though manufacturing, the factories are up and running again, the shops are opening, the consumer uh, confidence isn't quite there. So the, the, that, that's lag, lacking a little bit. So again, look at the emerging trends that are coming out of the markets and try and borrow best practice from those that are, are, are obviously are faring better than others. Be responsible for your deeds. Um, yeah, sometimes it's, you know, I blame the government for not giving me the help and support. Uh, you know, this is bad luck. You know, it, it happens. You know, this is part and parcel of being a pr pragmatic business owner. Take responsibility uh, and just get on. Keep your head down uh, and keep moving forward. And if you do make mistakes, don't beat yourself up. You know, nobody's perfect. We're not robots. You know, even the most successful entrepreneurs, uh, they make mistakes. In fact, they're, they're more happy to talk about their mistakes and their successes. It's almost like a badge of honor. But everybody makes mistakes. So if you do make mistakes, don't beat yourself up about it. Just if there's some learnings to draw from those mistakes, just draw those learnings. And then finally, you know, if you need that help, don't let pride get in your way. Don't, don't leave it on the back burner. Just uh, don't hope it's going to go away. If you need help, put your hand up, ask for it. If it's financial, if it's operational, personal, it could be your well-being. You know, I, I do a little bit of yoga and Pilates in the morning to try and keep my head in, in the right space there. And there's, there's lots of stuff out there to keep you... Uh, you know, keep focused and keep your mind clear. And then obviously make sure you can switch off as well. Sometimes if you're a small business owner, you know, the, the temptation is to go 24 hours a day and you're just going to burn yourself out. You know, you need to take yourself out of your, your business situation and have some R&R, &R, some rest and relaxation. So um, just to revisit those three uh, points that we looked at right at the beginning there. So we've understood what business resilience is. That's being tough and it's being prepared. Uh, we learned how to formulate a bespoke business continuity plan. So that's if you've already got a disaster recovery plan, then you need to supersize that and turn that into a business continuity plan, which is, which is going to be much more proactive rather than reactive. And then we've identified, identified where those potential opportunities lie, which are going to be those faster recovering um, sectors there. So um, we can now, uh, there's two more slides after this. Um, we can either do the Q&A after the two slides. Or, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll buzz you through the two slides and then we can do the Q&A after that. This is a little bit of help that I can provide you. So I do have a, a template that uh, I've used for my clients. It's a generic business continuity template. I'm happy to let anybody have that free of charge. You just need to drop me an email. and I'll send that over to you via uh, a Word document. I do a free sales health check via Skype. So if somebody's looking to maybe um, put, you know, generate more sales and get the sales up and running at a, a quicker rate there, I'm happy to do a free sales health check. Uh, I also have a discount code there. So I've got 14 online training courses. Um, you can visit them there, there. Those ones, those two are probably the most relevant ones, generating sales and recession, how to do inside sales, that's, that's virtual or remote selling. 
And if you want to use that um, promo code HOMELEARN, that will give you 30% off those two courses plus the other 12 that are on my website. And then finally, that's my contact details. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, I'm normally the top ranked Paul Durrant on LinkedIn there, but uh, if you're not linked in to me, I'm happy to link in with you on LinkedIn. And uh, I did mention that earlier. There's another plug for my book, Entrepreneurial Sales. It's available in paperback on uh, Waterstones website and Amazon, and it's available in Kindle. So, uh, Q and A. Right. Thanks very much, Paul. And uh, really interesting session. Just a couple of points to um, pick up on whilst we're uh, um, just getting some questions in. Well, first of all, let me just remind you if you are watching the uh, the uh, presentation today, um, if you have, do have any questions of Paul of any nature, then do. Uh, just click the Q&A button, type your question in, and um, we'll be happy to, uh, I'll be happy to put that to Paul on your behalf. Um, if you've got uh, anything you want to um, ask, which you think maybe isn't, isn't relevant, then put that down anyway. I'm sure we'll, we'll have a go at answering it. Um, and, and if you, most importantly, what I always say to people, if you've got a question which you think is stupid, uh, then uh, do fire that through to us as well, because the chances are everyone else in the, uh, that's watching may well have the same question. Um, just a note to you, Paul, at the moment we can see your PowerPoint uh, worksheet on the screen. So you might want to just either go to full screen for your slide or uh, go back so we can see you you yourself. Because at the moment we can see all your PowerPoint. That's it. Yeah. OK, great. Um, actually, just a couple of points I wanted to pick up on, Paul, from the presentation. I mean, first of all, uh, I guess in some ways it's quite right. You said 25 percent of small businesses do not reopen after a major crisis. Um, you know, which does sound quite worrying. On the other hand, I guess we could say, well, 75% of businesses do survive a crisis, which is uh, obviously a positive thing. Um, and that does show that the, um, the importance of, um, as you say, the, the bit of recovery plan. Um, I, would, I would hope that the sort of, the, the sort of people who are watching the, uh, the webinar today are the sort of people who are very much focused on business continuity and uh, how to survive a crisis. So I'm hoping that everyone that's watching today will fall within that 75%. Um, but even so, it's quite a... Uh, a significant hit isn't it 25 percent of um, small businesses yeah i think you'll, what you do is you'll get a concentration of, of those in particular sectors and obviously one to think about is retail isn't it you know uh, i think warehouse and oasis have just announced uh, uh, three thousand unfortunate uh, job losses but also um you know travel and leisure um b a have announced you know that i think they're going to um May have to make about 12,000 staff redundant and the Ryanair have just announced again this morning I think um, you know, 3,000 staff they're going to have to lay off so uh, you know it's, it sounds a high number but I, I suspect there's a, a big concentration of those 25% will be in several particular sectors which I, I identified at the beginning there you know hospitality leisure travel uh, and retail I think are probably going to yeah. take the brunt of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, another thing I like, I, I like which you picked up on was the uh, flexible pricing because I think particularly with small businesses we do tend to think okay well we've got a crisis and this is it and you talked about the, the bronze silver gold pricing I know Tesco one of the companies who really sort of promoted that where they introduced the, the normal everyday range of something and then they had a budget range and, and also a premium range so in effect uh, as you say this, the bronze silver and gold um, and you, what you're saying is really that could apply to any business that you, you could have flexible pricing more so than we do at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. If it's a product, you know, it might be a lesser specification or it might be a smaller size, volume, weight, uh, or if it's a service, you know, it's just a stripped down service where you're, you're maybe not offering a, as much as, as what you would do with your your standard service. But it, it, it just gives uh, your customers some wriggle room. So if they want to continue trading with you, but they can't currently afford to, to do that on your current pricing, it means you can keep that customer and then obviously when times are better you, you can start to uh you know put your prices up again this is something i say in normal times to all my clients is that you know have you put your prices up recently because uh, the cost of living goes up around about two three percent every year but lots of clients don't bother to do that they're worried they might lose their customers but um, generally if you're not you know taking the mickey and putting your price up 10 15 20 percent you, you can afford to do your pro put your pricing up 3% every year in normal circumstances. Obviously, this isn't normal, but uh, once we get back to normal, you can then think about perhaps building the, your margin profit back into your pricing. Yeah, good. Okay, coming to the, back to the uh, business continuity plan, um, you showed the figures there, large businesses, 73%, small businesses, 27%. And you mentioned the point you were quite surprised that, um, in effect, what you're saying is 27% of large businesses don't have a business continuity plan. Um, actually, the one that surprised me was the fact that 27% of small businesses do have one, uh, you know, because so many small businesses think that's the last thing they're thinking about, particularly if you're in, maybe in your first year of trading. So it's quite encouraging to think that people do have these plans. And, and you mentioned the benefits of having a business continuity plan. 
Um, are there any benefits? So, for example, um, if we if, if we are a business and we we decided to start put up a, together a business continuity plan a year ago during times of good during good times, uh, I'm, I'm thinking probably also that's the process of just compiling the business continuity plan makes you more aware of what your what your business is doing. It makes you more aware of your costs. It makes you more aware of of generally where your weak points are. So even if we never had a disaster. I would imagine there are still also hidden benefits of having a business continu continuity plan. Would you would you agree with that? Or yeah, absolutely. It's almost like doing an audit of your business, uh, yeah. where you can revisit every function, and uh, you might be able to identify uh, cost savings, um, productivity um, improvements by d just going through that whole process. Uh, and it's going to make you, you know, potentially uh, much more fit for purpose when something like this comes along. And as I've said, um, they, they, they say that, you know, the experts out there, which we're told to ignore, but now we're listening to, they're, they're telling us that these sorts of types of extreme weather events that can cause, you know, uh, storm damage, they're, they're going to happen more often. But the, the types of pandemic that we're looking at, you know, they're going to become potentially more frequent purely because of the, the growth rate in the, the world population. And, you know, we, we had minor events like uh, foot and mouth disease and uh, avian bird flu, you know, um, a while ago. Nothing quite like um, on the scale that we've seen with this particular one. But, um, you know, if we get a second spike of this uh, in the autumn or the winter, which potentially could happen, you know, we might have another lockdown again and we might be uh, in, the, in the same situation. So, you know, even if you haven't got a plan, and you've kind of muddled your way through and you've got to a point where you're OK. I think it's still worth putting that plan in place just in case this all happens again in sort of uh, six months time or so. Yeah, certainly. OK, uh, moving on to questions. Um, we talked about the, uh, the, the bank loans and the, uh, the bounce back loans now being um, available 100% uh, backed by the government. Uh, one thing you didn't mention and uh, um, I haven't heard mentioned so much today is the interest rates. Are there, um, obviously at the moment, interest rates are relatively low. Are there any sort of rules or procedures in place in terms of what the banks can charge for these loans? Can they charge, do they have to charge the same as they would in for a normal loan or can they charge whatever they want? Because that's one of the things which is putting off. There's a lot of businesses out there who maybe have never had a, a bank loan in their life. They've, they've managed to start up their business of their own savings or uh, various forms of capital. And they're very reluctant to go for a loan. So what are the rules or are there any rules about what the banks can charge in terms of interest rates? Yeah, certainly with the bounce back loans, um, apparently you're not going to pay any interest or repayments in the first year. So they haven't announced the interest rates for this. But all they've said is they're going to be competitive. So <laughs> we don't really know. I mean, there may well be more on that sort of uh, when they launch the scheme on Monday. But um, a case of just shop around really and see what's available to you. Now, there are various different funding pots out there that are available to you. Or some won't apply, some will. So uh, if you go to the, the main gov.uk page, all of the, uh, the state aid uh, is available there. And obviously, uh, you know, I know you've got information on the Chamber website as well as on the uh, Brentwood Council website as well. So just do, you know, might write off uh, an hour or two and, and just do some research and find out what, what uh, options are available to you out there. But um, you know that there, there is help. You might have to jump through some hoops to, to go through it. And I know with particular um, sources of income, um, I think only 16,000 businesses have so far taken um, some state aid on some of that, the, you know, the schemes that are available for the Chancellor made. And if you think about the, the number of uh, businesses, there are over, what, 5.9 million um, SMEs here in the UK. That's, it's a small fraction that so far have had that financial help. But um, yeah, in answer to your question, uh, with certainly with these bounce back loans, we don't know what the rate is, but we've been told it will be um, competitive. Right, so just to clarify, what, I mean, you, said, you said that there's no interest for the first year. So does that mean that someone could take out a loan and then as long as they repay it within the year, that, that, that it's not going to cost them anything? I, I, the, the details of that, I don't know. I suspect no, they've put in okay. some contingency for that. But um, right. uh, the, this, this, this particular bounce back scheme is being launched on Monday. So that, there okay. is some information out there. And I suspect um, hopefully we'll get a little bit more detail at the end of the week. Yeah, OK. Um, actually, there's another question sort of related to this, which uh, um, you may be able to... Um, expand on a little bit um, and it says I have a small service business I have money in the business account which won't decrease apart from my wages but I know it will take a few months to get back to normal trading once restrictions are lifted do you think I should make use of any of the state loans now as a buffer even though I don't think I will necessarily need it it's, I know it's, it's difficult to say about the detail but yeah the question, I mean that, speaking. yeah I mean that, that's a personal call for you I mean 
I, I suggest that every every business have an emergency fund um, and that if you don't have to use that fund, even in a situation like now, I think it's prudent to, to, to make sure you've still got that fund available because you never know what might, might else help in addition to what's already happening here. Um, so it, it's difficult to say. Um, uh, I would sort of uh, weigh up the, the interest rate, um, how much you need to get the business going. Um, they're talking about two years before the, the economy is fully up and, and running again. Um, a year until we get some sort of nor, nor normality to it. So certainly, um, you know, for the rest of the year here, it's going to be a very depressed market uh, and it's going to be quite difficult to, uh, you know, replicate the sort of type of turnover and revenue that you might have generated a, a year or two ago. So you're going to have to take it in the round and um, keep an eye on what's happening out there. But um, I wouldn't suggest necessarily depleting your emergency fund to zero because you never know what's going to happen um, above and beyond especially if you, uh, you don't get that state aid because you don't qualify, um, you know, uh, through the process. Great, okay. Um, another question for you, Paul. Um, there's clearly a crossover between resilience and innovation as we move through to the long-term recovery period, but how is it best to weigh up the level of risk it's wise to take as we look at new opportunities, products and services to diversify into? So you're talking about innovation during a uh, during this period, but obviously there is a risk there. What, how, how, how is it best to weigh up the level of risk? Well, the risk is if you don't do anything, um, you're going to stand still. And standing still these days is actually going backwards. See, you, any business has to keep innovating and, and being creative in, um, you know, uh, keeping their model, their business model viable, fresh and, and relevant. And the only way you're going to do that is to keep elevating, uh, you know, the business and keep innovating. Uh, and that's going to help you stand out. And, you know, if you're not standing out you, uh, and you're melding into to what everybody else is doing, you, you're almost invisible. So um, you, you do need, you should, you should be investing uh, in being innovative and in, in being you know, creative within your business and um, uh, moving your model on, uh, even in uh, good times as well as hard times. So I, I would suggest uh, it's not a risk to, to be trying to innovate and to, to be more creative in your business to make it stand out. Yes, yeah, certainly. I remember in the, in the webinar, which I did last week, about um, um, our approach to uh, how we handle the crisis. One of the points I mentioned is that the, uh, uh, the companies and organisations who uh, fare best in a crisis are the ones who innovate the most. It's always, and that, just, that doesn't just apply to business, actually, it applies generally to the, um, the, you know, the, the way we operate in life is uh, the ones who, in, ones who innovate most are the ones who survive. So, and as you say, this is an opportunity to innovate. Um, and also, everyone's from, from my from my perspective everyone's actually ready for change anyway because people are seeing change all around them so people are more used to change at the moment so in actual fact it's quite a good time to introduce innovations because people won't be surprised by it they'll be almost expecting it so um, and, and as you say if you don't innovate then more likely those those are the sort of businesses which won't survive yeah and so, some really innovative brands launched during a recession they include burger king um, ibm uh, disney uh, Microsoft, and then also in the, the financial crash in 2008, uh, Groupon launched. Um, they saw the fact that uh, people wanted to continue treating themselves and having those little luxuries and rewarding themselves, but they didn't have the disposable income and budget, so they produced the Groupon, the, the Groupon um, uh, effects. And even though they have laid off quite a few people, unfortunately, now, I mean, up until um, uh, a couple of months ago, they're in 35 countries and, and turning over $2 billion. But they, they launched uh, in a recession with a particular model that could continue to, to give people those little luxuries and treats that they, they felt they deserved, but they couldn't afford. Yeah, so certainly, uh, and, also, and also the, the time of the recession, the survival of the fittest, and uh, there's many, many, as you said, well, you gave many examples of companies who have actually launched during the recession <coughs> or alternatively, companies have taken the opportunity to expand during the recession because of uh, increased opportunity. Yeah, Angel Investors is a classic example there. They're always looking for those opportunities where they potentially can invest, uh, uh, you know, and make a bit of a killing in a business yeah. that, um, you know, got that potential. Uh, and that's, you know, the, that's almost the, the, that's the difference between an entrepreneur and a small business owner is you, you, you've got a little bit of vision. You can see beyond what's currently happening and uh, where the business could be going. And then, you know, that's when you take the risk and, and you invest in that innovation and that creativity. 
Well, I think that's a great way to uh, to uh, finish. So, as you say, I mentioned there about the um, the vision and the looking to the he- looking to the future and seeing where the opportunities are, uh, and that's what it's all about, really, is to ensure that uh, all of you watching today are one of those businesses which do uh, not only survive the current crisis but do thrive in it and use it as an opportunity to um, look at how your business is running and look for new opportunities uh, and indeed come out of this crisis uh, fitter, leaner, and healthier. So uh, thanks very much today for your presentation, Paul. Uh, I, I believe you did mention you're happy to share your slides with uh, any of those and of our guests who are watching today. Uh, my recommendation is if you would like to uh, get a copy of the slides from Paul, uh, probably the easiest thing is if you want to drop him an email. His email address is on the, on the screen at the moment. And uh, just let him know that you're watching the, the webinar today and he'll be happy to send you uh, the details. And obviously, detail, if you're interested in any of the uh, products which he mentioned, uh, or indeed, the, uh, I can see the book there as well. So it might be worth, worth reading during the, the time you've got at the moment. Um, so all that remains really for me to do is just to, well, first of all, uh, uh, you may be wondering what our next webinar is. We're actually just in the process of finalising um, a presenter for next Tuesday. So we should have details of that one later on today. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, if you do have any ideas uh, for potential subjects which you'd either like to hear about or which you would like to uh, talk to us about, then do let me know. And uh, if you want to see a recording of this webinar, we will send out an email to all those who've attended, but also if you just click on the uh, uh, Brentwood Chamber of Commerce YouTube page, uh, you'll find this um, webinar either later today or tomorrow and also you'll find uh, the previous webinars if you'd like to have a look at them as well if you haven't already seen them. So all that remains for me really is to uh, thank all of you very much today for joining us and watching the webinar. Uh, thanks to Paul for your expert presentation and uh, my pleasure. Just, just picking up on one other point which you mentioned towards the end of your presentation about rest and recuperation. Um, do yeah. make sure um, because for those of you who don't work at home you, you may not be used to sort of um, uh, knocking off so there may be people that aren't used to working and they find that you're working eight o'clock at night nine o'clock at night so do make sure you take a few hours off and um, we've got the weekend coming up so uh, I'd just like to say to you make sure you take some time off during the weekend and enjoy your weekend thanks very much okay. and goodbye thank you